Um, hello and welcome uh, to the Digging In series. Um, I want to begin today's just a little differently than I normally do. Um, I just want to um, mention some very sad news in the field of archaeology. We all just found out that um, our beloved Mary Beaudry from Boston University passed away yesterday. Um, she was not only huge in the field of archaeology, particularly New England archaeology, she really served as a mentor to so many people in the field um, who either were undergraduate students of hers, graduate students, or just worked with her and all that. So I just wanted to let everyone know um, about that news and um, just to remark how much we, we love Mary and we're really gonna miss not only her contributions to the field, but just her hysterical, funny nature. That was always just so much fun to hang out. Um, with that, hello and welcome into Digging In. I'm Lindsay Randall, the host of the speaker series. Digging In is a series of live presentations with archaeologists from around the country, co-sponsored by the Robert S. Peabody Institute of Archaeology and the Massachusetts Archaeological Society. Join us every other Wednesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time through November for our presentations. And for a schedule of dates and presenters, please visit us at the peabody.andover.edu or at the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's Facebook page. Viewers are going to be able to submit questions directly to me, the moderator, via the chat function on the side of your Zoom screen. At the conclusion of the presentation, we will give our speaker time to answer as many questions as they can with the understanding that they might not get to all of them. And so today we are excited to have Mr. David Robinson join us. Mr. Robinson is the Director and Chief Archaeologist for the Massachusetts Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources, which is the sole trustee of the Commonwealth's Underwater Cultural Heritage and is charged with encouraging the discovery, reporting and interpretation and protection of these resources. Prior to joining, um, you are, I never know how to pronounce that. You are. Uh, you are. Mr. Robinson was president of a Rhode Island-based submerged cultural resource management consulting firm and a marine archaeologist at the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. Over the course of his 29-year career, David has worked as a submerged cultural resource management consultant, archaeological conservator, researcher, and educator. And he has conducted interdisciplinary marine archaeological investigations of submerged shipwrecks in paleocultural and maritime cultural landscapes, and has worked extensively with federal and state agencies, tribes, industry, muse museum, and academic institutions in the United States and abroad. So welcome, Mr. Robinson, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Lindsay, for that great introduction, and thank you all for, for coming to today's talk. Um, it is, Massachusetts Archaeology Month, even though we're, uh, we're all doing things remotely. So um, with that in mind, uh, the topic of my talk today was, was selected. I wanted to pick something that was uh, very much a, a Massachusetts subject. And uh, I also wanted it to be something fresh. I've, I've given lots of talks in our area on a number of different topics, but this one is one that I haven't talked about before. And I am not going to uh, claim to be an expert on this site yet. I'm getting to know this site, uh, the rec site of the Ada K. Damon, and um, I'm going to share with you some of the things that we've learned recently uh, about this site uh, as a result of uh, some pretty stormy weather that has impacted the site in a very significant way recently. So I'm going to start my PowerPoint and For your patience. <laughs> Let's see. Hmm. Technology is always like this. Yeah, no, no usually I have more luck on that. Uh, here we go. 
That's it. There. How does that look? Perfect. Good. All right. Great. So as uh, Lindsay mentioned, I am the director of the Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources, and the board is the sole trustee of the Commonwealth's Underwater Cultural Heritage, and we are the ones charged with encouraging the discovery, reporting, interpretation, and protection of these resources. The uh, resources in the state of Massachusetts include uh, a variety of different types of, of archaeological sites. Uh, most of them that are underwater are shipwrecks, and we have about 3,500 documented wrecks in Massachusetts waters. But we also have submerged Native American sites and coastal infrastructure like wharves, uh, old canals, um, and even aircraft that are submerged in our waters. We serve. Uh, we serve people of the Commonwealth. Our, our role and my, my job in particular is to promote and protect uh, your interests in the resources uh, that we have here for recreational, economic, environmental, and historical purposes. And um, I welcome you to contact me. Uh, my contact information is down in the lower right-hand corner there. Uh, anytime you wanna discuss anything to do with Massachusetts underwater archeology, span or if you have any questions, or if you find something that uh, you see along the coast that you want to report to us. Uh, the BUAR's jurisdiction extends throughout uh, the Commonwealth in both the coastal waters uh, within the, the federal water limit of three miles, uh, as well as across Cape Cod Bay, and into the interior. Uh, we are responsible for the management of submerged cultural resources in all of the Commonwealth's uh, inland waters ponds, rivers, streams, um, and even wetlands. In terms of uh, our coastal jurisdiction, that jurisdiction in the intertidal zone is shared between us and the Massachusetts Historical Commission. The UAR is not a part of the Massachusetts Historical Commission or the Massachusetts uh, State Historic Preservation Office. We are actually a, a nine-member board with a, a staff member, the director, me, and that board is composed of uh, representatives from the Office of the State Archaeologist, the State Archivist, the Coastal Zone Management, Department of Conservation and Recreation and Waterways, the Environmental Police, and the Massachusetts Historical Commission. We also have governor-appointed mar uh, maritime archaeologist uh, position and two governor-appointed recreational diving community representatives. And this group is uh, works to uh, Help, help the director and, and make decisions about uh, permits. We do permitting for people who um, are interested in doing underwater archaeology in the state, but also um, in terms of uh, deciding about public outreach initiatives and things like that. The board's a, a very active board with a lot of different uh, areas of expertise. So today's topic is the uh, Ada K. Damon. Ada K. Damon was a two-masted 83-foot by 23-foot by 90-ton fishing schooner built in 1875 in Essex by Ebenezer Burnham. Uh, this is not the Ada K. Damon in the picture here, but uh, I included this picture because I haven't been able to find any pictures of the Ada K. Damon under sail uh, or at work. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of what these vessels look like. And you know, if you're from Massachusetts, then you're you're pretty familiar with this type of vessel because it's kind of the quintessential Massachusetts ship type. Um, the Burnham family, um, and if you're from um, North Shore of, of Massachusetts, you're certainly familiar with uh, the Burnham shipyard, which is still in operation, but the Burnham family was among the earliest uh, shipbuilders in the area, uh, beginning in the 1630s, and among the most prominent. Uh, the Ada K. Damon was uh, part of Gloucester's fishing schooner fleet from 1876 to 1882. Its owner, Sylvanus Smith, was a renowned Gloucester fisherman, uh, a captain and businessman, and representative of the Massachusetts House of Representatives and Senate. Ada K. Damon was sold in 1882 to Philip Wharf and home ported uh, in Provincetown, so it was moved to Provincetown in 1885. Uh, Ada K. The Damon had a a typical and unremarkable career as a fishing schooner, except when a heavy snowstorm capsized one of its dories and unfortunately killed six of its crew members in 1893. 
The vessel was sold in 1909 to Albert Brewster, a farmer from Maine, who converted it into a sand schooner. Sand was um, in demand for its use in concrete by Boston construction companies, and sand from Plum Island in particular was prized for its hardness and appearance in floor surfaces used at the time in fireproof buildings. Sand was loaded, as you can see in this picture here, by taking the vessel broadside to the beach during high tide and anchoring in the stem and stern. At low tide, a long gangplank was extended from the ship to the beach, and wheelbarrows of sand were loaded on board by the ship's crew. The Ada K. Damon set off for Plum Island from York, Maine, on its very first sand harvesting trip on December 26, 1909. During the trip, Brewster was forced to anchor this sand in Ipswich Bay to ride out hurricane-forced winds that were associated with the Christmas storm of 1909, so his timing was uh, unfortunate. Unfortunately, also, the uh, vessel's anchors couldn't hold, and during the storm, the chains parted, and the ADK Dam was driven ashore up into the intertidal waters of Steep Hill Beach. Steep Hill Beach is now a part of the Crane Estates Trustees of Reservation property that's in Ipswich. And here you can see where the right side is located. Steep Hill Beach it is to the north and west of Crane Beach, which some of you have probably been to. Um, go back to this one. Um, the Plum Island Life Saving Station crew visited the wreck on December 27th and 28th and found that the crew was safe, but the ship was full of water and seas were breaking over. Life Saving crew offered assistance, but Brewster declined, the captain, uh, declined because he believed he could still float the ship after the ballast was removed. When the ship couldn't be refloated, Brewster tried to sell the ship to wreckers, but found no buyers. On January 2nd, 1910, Brewster stripped the vessel of its valuables with the assistance of the life-saving uh, crew members, and the Ada K. Damon was declared a total loss. With his entire life savings invested in the Ada K. Damon, Brewster returned to Maine penniless, seeking farm work. He died in 1930, and records indicate that he had no family or heirs. So it's kind of a it's, a, it's a tragic story for the ship, but it's also a, a sad story for, for its owner. Since its loss in the winter of 1909-1910, Ada K. Damon has been exposed continually to natural and cultural site formation processes. These include lake action, sediment deposition, and salvage. The wreck became a local attraction. These are pictures that are taken within the year of its sinking, so you can see it's already starting to break down even within a year. And uh, ironically, it's got its full load of sand on board, as you can see here. Uh, the wreck became a local attraction and landmark for visitors to gather and hold picnics and take pictures. Their proportions of the vessels of the vessel deteriorated over time until only the lower third of the intact hull was preserved beneath the beach shifting sands. Elements of Ada K. Damon's buried hull, its stem, stem post, and its framing, um, over the years have become uh, buried and exposed uh, intermittently. Uh, for several decades, uh, the remains of the ship were buried until the early 2000s when the ADK Damon reemerged from the sands. Between 2015 and 2017, uh, the ADK Damon's wreck site was the focus of archaeological field schools. These uh, field schools were run uh, by a group called CMAP uh, that partnered with Salem State University and the National Park Service. Archaeology Society and um, Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources. Um, the field schools were led by Salem State um, uh, University faculty member Calvin Myers and uh, my retired predecessor, who some of you also may know, uh, Vic Mastone. One of the aspects of the, the courses that were taught by, by uh, Dr. Myers and, and Mr. Mary Stone um, included a, a concept that I think is uh, it's a really elegant model both for thinking about uh, how how ships uh, lives progress through their their history, but also it's a it's an elegant model for thinking about the long term management of a wreck site uh, after it's uh, become part of the archaeological record. And uh, this diagram that was uh, created by Dr. Myers and, and the model that, that 
he came up with. Um, very simply, it just it, it looks at the ship um, and its history holistically uh, from its birth during its construction and how it related to the economy and thinking about the purpose that the vessel was built for and where the materials came from. Uh, and then it's its life, it's its actual use life, um, both its primary uses and then ships, if they, they don't sink and they're around for, for, for a while, they often get uh, repurposed for other types of, of uh, activities and, and commerce. And then of course the, the sinking um, and sometimes you know vessels are salvaged but uh, when they become uh, part of their archaeological record and are, are lost for, for good, um, they, they are in a way um, uh, changed and reshaped by natural and, and cultural processes you know, to be reborn uh, as historic sites, as things that um, we become interested in because of their age, because of the technology they represent or the cultures they represent, and also because of their connection to uh, place and to people. And I think, um, and, and I know that uh, Dr. Myers and, and Mr. Mastone thought about this in, a, I think, a similar way. Um, the Ada K. Damon, in particular, had this role as a, a really important um, touchstone to the past for the community of, of the North Shore and of, of Ipswich. So, um, you know, for, for most of its history since its sinking, at the, you know, just after the, yeah, the, 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 the turn of the century, the 20th, 20th century, uh, the vessel was, was a part of the, the fabric of the place. It was a part of the beach, it was a part of the community, and it lay protected in this bed of sand um, up until fairly recently. Up until Hurricane Teddy decided to roll through the North Atlantic uh, last month, between September 21st and 23rd, Hurricane Teddy came up the coast. And even though it was a couple hundred miles off the shores of Massachusetts, um, it came at a time that coincided with uh, king tides, the seasonal king tides that we have. Um, that produce uh, tides on the order of three to four feet higher than normal anyway. You combine that with the storm surge and the, the strong winds of a hurricane, and you've got a, kind of a, a perfect storm situation for, for the coast of Massachusetts. And so, um, sure enough, high seas, large waves came and visited the site of Gate of Damon. Now, in, when I started, I've only been in my uh, my job as the director of UAR since last May. And one of the things that um, Mr. Mastone did with me uh, shortly after I started was took me to uh, the site of the AK MC. Um, I'd been interested in it. I was aware of the work that, that he and Dr. Myers had done. And uh, we had heard, or he, Victor had heard, that the site was becoming progressively more exposed. So we went and took a look at it in September. And uh, this is what we saw. Vessel that was completely intact, at least the, the wreck was intact. Uh, the bottom of the hull is there. You can see the stern post. This is a stern uh, view looking towards the bow of the ship. Uh, you can see knees that supported decking. You can see the ribs or the frames that, that held the shape of the ship. And you can see the outer hull planking. I received an email on uh, September 23rd from the trustees uh, letting me know that the storm had done great damage to the Ada K. Damon. So I scheduled a trip to the site and on September 25th, I visited the site and I was completely floored by uh, what I saw. The site had changed dramatically. Um, it was no longer in its original location. In fact, um, had been uh, dismantled and broken into uh, one large piece and a number of smaller pieces that I'm going to show you um, some photographs of. So, but the question is, is why did this happen? Why did this happen now? And I think part of the answer is not, was it just a coincidence of the king tides and the passage of a hurricane far offshore that contributed to the uh, damage and, and destruction of, of this site, but it's also, um, as many of you are probably uh, are aware, um, climate change, sea level rise um, is becoming increasingly more of a problem along our coast. 
a study that was done by uh, councils on management and uh, other participants in 2014-2015, looking at coastal erosion uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, identified a number of areas along the coast that uh, had high rates of erosion. And as, as it turns out, the North Shore of Massachusetts and the area where the Ada K. Dam and rec site was, is included in one of the areas that is eroding rapidly along the coast of Massachusetts. If we take a slightly closer look, and this is a draft um, version of the Massachusetts Coastal Erosion Viewer that is being developed by CZM in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, this hasn't gone live yet, so this is kind of a sneak preview. Um, but if we look closely and we look at the area where the AK Damon is, you can see that uh, there's an indication that that area is part of this coast uh, that is eroding. Other parts are creeding or are staying the same. Uh, Crane Beach is an area that um, is eroding you know, to a significant extent. But the area where the Indicate Damon is, at least part of the beach where it's located, is one of the places that is eroding. And if we look at the changes in coastline, you can see that the, the current shoreline, or the, the one closest to current, the dark blue line, is further in from where it had been even as early as 1994 uh, or in the 1940s. There is fluctuation and, and the entire beach isn't retreating, but the area where the, the wreck was is, is right there kind of at the cusp of where erosion and fa fairly significant erosion is taking place. So I do think that, that this has contributed or did contribute to um, the reason why the vessel and why the wreck was lost. And, and part of that is um, due to the fact that if you look at pictures that are fairly recently, and these were shared uh, with me by a person who lives locally and was walking past the site when I was there, uh, Susan Turner, and she took these pictures back in June. And looking at them as compared to what the wreck looked like when I uh, first saw the site in last September, there is significantly more of the hull that was exposed even by June. And then by September, and this is a couple of weeks before the storm, even more of the hull was exposed. So um, perhaps it's it's a, it's it's a seasonal thing, but maybe not. And um, it's something that we, we, we need to be thinking about um, in terms of broader management issues uh, related to cultural resources, cultural resources along the state. Um, in terms of what BUAR has done since uh, we were told that the ship had broken apart, uh, we visited the site on three different occasions. I went to the site uh, a couple times in September and once earlier this month uh, with volunteers and with board members. This is board member uh, Graham McKay uh, out taking a look at the site. The very first visit was just, just to go take a look and see what was there um, and get a, a kind of a gross overall uh, idea of, of how damaged the site was. Part of that assessment was uh, taking some aerial photographs and volunteer Chris Wright um, came out with us with his drone uh, so that we could get some, some low altitude images of the beach and of the individual pieces of wreckage. So we were able to accomplish that. Uh, more recently, I've gone out to the site uh, to collect GPS positions on all the different major pieces of wreckage so that we can get a good map, a good map of the site. And also uh, Dr. Myers came out with me to do some detailed documentation of some of the timbers. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, yes, it's, it's, it's sad and it's disappointing that the, the, the wreck has been uh, removed from its original context and broken into pieces, but there is an upside. And um, the upside is, is that we now can access portions of the hull that we couldn't access before for recreation and documentation purposes. So part of um, what we've been doing in the last month has involved doing some of that work. So in terms of the, the mapping effort, um, looking at Google Earth images of the site, I was able to determine that the site wall is intact, measured about 175 square meters in size. Since the storm, the change has been very dramatic. The, uh, 
The site has actually expanded by 428 times its original size to an area. Uh, we've got wreckage scattered over an area, at least as far back as we can see, uh, over an area that's about 75,000 square meters. And uh, the site is now spread out over about 9.2 acres of the beach. Um, there's wreckage that was trapped uh, in the, the, uh, the jetty that was uh, there at the north side. It's going back here, you can see some of it uh, trapped in the, the rocks there. And the jetty almost acted like a, it reminded me of a chain link fence uh, and the, the plastic bags at a grocery store to get stuck in the fence. It captured a lot of the, the planks and stopped them from washing into the river, although some did wash into the river. Uh, we saw evidence of that. Um, the site is, uh, there's, there's heavy timbers, like this is a, one of the Kielsen's, one of the internal parts of the ship's spine uh, that was manufactured for multiple sections. The, the pieces of that are visible. There's some framing. There are uh, quite a few planks on the outside and the inside of the hull. They're scattered about on the beach. Um, this is the aerial view of the, the original wreck location, uh, what it looks like now. There is a section of keel that is visible. It's kind of down here at the bottom of the picture. There's also the, the cook stove from the ship that uh, you can see and broken pieces of it, as well as some pieces of chain. This is a piece of the standing rigging. And um, yeah, this is, this is a section of chain that's down here. And here's some, some closer up images. This, uh, if this is one of the anchor chains, which it certainly could be, this is kind of a poignant uh, artifact on the site in that it was you know, the chains that couldn't hold in the storm that led to the wreck, and uh, led to the vessel wrecking. This is a section of standing rigging. It's a close up view of, of the stove. This is an aerial view of the biggest piece of wreckage that, that actually stayed intact. And what you see here is the, the stem or the bow of the ship is to the left. So this is the stem assembly here. And these are the two halves of the, the, the bottom of the hull to the turn of the bilge. <clears throat> this whole section extends, it's, it's the, the port side extends the full length of the ship. This is where it came into the stern uh, back here. Uh, this portion, this half of the hull is the preserved uh, completely, but, but it's, it's, it's essentially the entire outside of the bottom of the, the hull that peeled off, it ripped off the keel, which would have run down the center here and kind of popped open almost like a zipper um, and was held together just by the, the, the fasteners that attached it to the stem. So it's almost like a, 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 a butterfly flying through the, moving through the water. This section of wreckage uh, traveled 168 meters to the northwest of the original location of the site. So incredible power that the sea had to move uh, this, this size and, and weight of, of material up the beach that far. And oh, just, for, uh, just for reference for scale, these are two foot squares, these graphic scales you can see down here. So it's, a, it's a big section of it. As I said, um, there is a plus side to, to what's happened to the ADK Damon. Um, we are able to see parts of the hull that have been invisible for over 100 years, or almost 100 years, no, over 100 years, 110 years, um, for the first time. And what we see is something that we see a lot on submerged sites, and that is um, when sites, when the, when the portions of ships that sink, uh, get buried under the sands and under, the, under the silt, uh, they tend to be very, very well preserved. So here we see, um, unlike the, the, the timbers that extended above the sand line, which were uh, degraded by bacteria and weather and freezing and thawing and, and uh, little critters that, that eat the wood, uh, the wood that was buried is, is in remarkable condition. The surfaces of the wood are in remarkable condition, uh, preserved so much that you can see tool marks like you see on the inside of the planks from uh, up and down saws and the um, dubbing marks or the, the, the marks uh, from an ads uh, that was used to shape the, the framing timbers. Uh, we also get to see that some of the surfaces of the wood aren't finished. Uh, they used um, 
some naturally grown compass timbers uh, and in some cases didn't bother to do any shaping the outside and just left the, the natural round of the wood uh, on the timber. So we get to see those kind of details. We see this looks like a little um, patch to the to the right, a plug that was put through the planks to maybe stop a leak or fill a split. We also even see uh, evidence of the hand of the, the shipbuilders, of, of the guys that were working in the shipyard building this vessel. Uh, in this case, we see them in this inscription. Uh, it's a number of 13. This is frame number, floor number 13 in the, in the ship, as well as the scribe down the center to show where the center line of the frame or the floor was and where it was intended to be placed on top of the keel. Um, we actually saw, uh, I think we saw 28 different uh, floor timbers that were all inscribed with different numbers. So again, it's uh, it's, it's really remarkable to see the, the hand of the, the shipwright in the uh, in the remains of the wreck. It's something that uh, had this been exposed, uh, we, we would have lost it. And had it stayed buried, we wouldn't have seen it. So in terms of um, you know, what, what do we do now with the ADK game and what, what are our, our thoughts about how do we, how do we manage this site? Uh, if you think back to that model that I showed you of Dr. Myers of the, the life of a ship, uh, the ship is, is now in its, in its final stages of life. And, um, you know, there are many, you, you, you see them in the paper, whenever we have a storm, uh, I'll get a call it'll end up in the paper that somebody has found exposed shipwreck on a beach. You know, it happens a lot on the Outer Cape. So there's, there's a lot of these vessels that have suffered the same fate that the Anakia Damon has now uh, most recently suffered where eventually they, they break apart and they go back into the, the, the earth. Um, so this is, you know, it, it, like I said, it's, it's, it's sad that it's, it's been destroyed. It was a part of the fabric of the local, you know, the local uh, community for a very long time. It was something that I think a lot of people enjoyed seeing. Uh, and now it's, it's just in the natural process of breaking down. But, but what can we do um, with the ADK game and before it is, it is really gone forever? Um, one of the things I've noticed about these coastal wrecks that are exposed and unexposed after storms is they don't stay exposed usually for very long. And so there is a, um, there are near term uh, as well as long term uh, management ideas that, uh, and, and things that we can do to, to uh, get the most of the story that the ADK Damon has to tell us uh, out of the site before it, before it eventually does uh, degrade and, and disappear. And so um, the Board of Underwater Archaeological Resources is uh, partnering with the trustees and we are going to be holding a meeting to discuss the long range management of the site. But in the short term, I am going to continue to go out and plan to be working with trustee volunteers to do some more of the detailed documentation of the wreck to, to record some of those details that, that I showed you. So that's, that's the near-term uh, plan. Um, in the multiple visits that I've been out there, I've noticed that the, the small individual pieces of plank that we in, in framing that we were concerned might, might uh, float away or become hazardous debris to boaters, they seem to be mostly reburying in the sand. Um, we're seeing more and more uh, with each visit to the site, uh, these things being reburied in the sand. So, uh, need to get out there and, and document those before they are completely buried. Uh, the larger pieces of wreckage, uh, they'll take a little longer to, to bury, but um, there, is, there is sort of a, uh, there's a need to get on this quickly and to, to, to get the site documented while we can. There's only a, so much of a window that we have you know, for accessing this site, so we, we want to do that. Um, some of the other things that uh, we've been thinking about in terms of the longer range uh, preservation is to um, perhaps recover some uh, elements of the hull for curation at uh, the Crane Estate uh, in their archives and their collections and in their displays. So these are all things that we're going to be talking about, uh, like I said, with the trustees as well as um, the, the, the town um, 
historic Ipswich uh, will be involved in this conversation, Burnham Shipyard and others. The other context that uh, I mentioned earlier in the talk that, that um, is also the, the, the Damon I think is, is, a, is a poignant and dramatic illustration of is, is the context of coastal resiliency planning, not just for property and obviously you know, property is important. My house just suffered a lot of water damage. So I have a, a intimate familiarity with the pain and suffering that goes along with, with having your house get battered by waves and, and be flooded like these poor houses are. But um, uh, the, the planning of, of how we deal with sea level rise and the impact from it needs to begin to focus and include uh, cultural resources and the impacts uh, that sea level rise and erosion has to these types of resources. And so it's not just, it's not just architectural resources, it's also archeological resources. Um, we've known uh, from examples like uh, uh, Lucy Vincent uh, bluffs overlooked that beach there have been eroding at a very rapid rate. We know from examples like that, that, that ancient native sites are at risk from sea level rise and erosion, but, but the, the, the ADK Damon uh, tells us that uh, it's, it's also shipwreck sites. It's, it's, there are these coastal sites that have survived for a long time intact, uh, that are, have been buried and now are becoming exposed and are at risk of loss. So these are things that need to be thought about in a, in a broader way. Uh, in terms of the management of the submerged cultural resources and cultural, cultural heritage of the state of Massachusetts. So if you'd like to learn more about the Ada K. Damon, um, the Trustees of Reservations, and their blog site on their webpage, they're going to be updating it with more information about our discussions with them. Um, if you want to see the site, I, I do recommend you go out and take a look at the site. It's, it's, it's you know, one of those cultural resources that's very accessible. Um, it hasn't been accessible for a long time. You can see parts of it now that people haven't seen in generations. So, um, you know, just uh, I, I believe you have to get a pass to, to visit the Castle Hill site. Um, so just go online uh, at this website here and, and or the pass that allows you to access the, the it's, it's the Steep Hill Beach, not, not Crane Beach, so they're, they're two separate sites. And you access Steep Hill from, from the um, Castle Hill site. And then uh, most of, or some of you, I'm sure, uh, who are listening today are very familiar with the historic Ipswich website and the work of Gordon Harris. He's done an excellent job of um, developing a, a photo, photo documentation of the site. Uh, both the historic photographs, many of which I included in this presentation, but also more recent photographs on the site since since the damage and um, and in the, the, the months and years leading up to that damage. There's also a, an excellent uh, piece that Gordon has put together that's on the site on sand schooners, which is, um, I think, kind of fascinating aspect of the history of, of the ADK Damon that it was involved in that, that industry or almost involved in that industry. And then um, another uh, website of interest is Lowell's Boat Shop um, put a video tour of the wreck that was done uh, this, this summer uh, where uh, Graham McKay walked around the site with Harold Burnham, the descendant of the builder of the wreck. And it's about a 45 minute long video and uh, it's very interesting. You know, Harold uh, makes a number of comments that are of interest about the, the vessel. So uh, at this point, I'd, I'd like to thank you and I'm happy to take any questions that, uh, that you may have. Well, thank you for that, David. Um, that was fantastic. Especially, um, many of you don't know this, but I am an Ipswich resident. I'm currently in Ipswich right now in my house. So when uh, David was like, what should I talk about? I was like, ah, oh, Ada K. Damon. Because I, I absolutely love going to visit her. I have not unfortunately been able to visit her um, since the wreck and everything. So please send us your questions. Um, but as the uh, moderator, I'm going to start with the first question. And it is actually not a under, not a Ada K. Damon specific question for you, uh, David, but what got you interested in maritime archaeology to begin with? Oh boy. Um, well, I started 
diving with a mask when I was three on the Cape. My, uh, my grandparents owned a house in South Harwich and uh, I hated getting water up my nose. So I, uh, my mom bought me a mask and it kept the water on my nose, but more importantly, it opened up this amazing underwater world to this little guy's eyes and brain that uh, has kept me fascinated my entire life. And then um, growing up in Narragansett, Rhode Island by the coast, a lot of my, my friends' dads were fishermen and um, my dad was a commercial diver. So there was, there was water everywhere. I was born in Newport. Um, the, the sea and people living on the making living working on the sea and boats were always part of my my youth growing up and um, I did a history project in 10th grade with a friend where we we had just become certified divers and we got to dive on a, this 1880 steamboat wreck the Rhode Island off of Bonnet Point and we made we, we mapped the site to the best of our ability we made drawings of artifacts that we found and did historic research and found some pictures and stuff of it and uh, submitted this for a special project and got an A. And it made me realize, wow, you can combine scholarship with like going out and having fun, doing what you're really interested in and like have academic success doing it. So um, that planted the seed in my head and then um, I was a commercial fisherman and Started anthropology and uh, was a diving instructor, and the things all just sort of meshed together into a career path that came to me when my father in law gave me a, a book called The Sea Remembers, written by Peter Throckmorton, that was all about underwater archaeology. And then there was a National Geographic cover story that was about the oldest shipwreck in the world being studied by um, folks from Texas AM University's Nautical Archaeology Program. So when I finished up my undergraduate at URI, I applied to Texas A&M and the kid from the Ocean State went to the Central Plains of Texas to learn how to be an underwater archaeologist. <laughs> That's how it started. Love it. Um, so we do have a sort of comment slash question from okay. Kira, who I don't know if she had to leave already. Um, she is thinking about like the long-term plan for the conserving and curating of this wreck and how it is of great value to the town of Ipswich and you know Essex and surrounding areas I would say as well. Um, given that please, some of the pieces are floating away some may have been you know sort of pilfered by visitors um, is there a way or what kind of discussions have been had about maybe curating some of these pieces for the hip, uh, history of Ipswich. Um, and I'm asking this question on behalf of Kira as all I'm thinking is Ipswich Museum, the trustees and Gordon Harris are probably like, wait, what? Curating maritime stuff? <laughs> Soak that stuff in water, right? But um, so is there a way to do that? It, would people want, is there value in that? Like maybe saving some parts of this wreck or anything like that? Well, my personal opinion is, is the answer is yes. I think most of us who are involved in archaeology or interested in archaeology, part of part of what really um, grabs us is when you encounter something that's from the past that's tangible, that that is a thing. It's an artifact. It's an object. It's a it's a shipwreck. When when you see something like that with your own eyes and, and can touch it even, um, it, it just creates this really powerful link to the past that I think is undeniable. And so preserving artifacts, preserving parts or entire shipwrecks um, has, a, has a, a value. I think, it's, I think it is something that's worth doing and important. The, the, the downside or the, the part that has to also be considered though is that objects, particularly organic objects, have been underwater for a long time and especially in salt water. They undergo changes while they're in the archaeological record that when you remove them from the context of being submerged or wet really alters uh, them pretty dramatically. So you can't just take things out of the water 
They've been underwater for a long time and bring them up onto dry land and expect them to survive. They won't, they'll disintegrate. And so in addition to curation of these things and the long-term care and maintenance of, of whatever is recovered, there's also conservation, archeological conservation that's required to stabilize materials that are removed from a, a, a wet environment, an underwater environment. And that's a long time consuming, um, specialized, you need specialized training and people to, to do that kind of work. And it's expensive. Um, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily expensive. So in the old days of underwater archeology, span there was always a push, push, push to, to recover shipwrecks and to raise shipwrecks. But it became pretty quickly apparent that while there is a lot of um, enthusiasm for bringing something up from underwater and having it be, be, people being able to see it, the enthusiasm for paying for the long-term care and feeding and, and conservation um, of these things wasn't there. And so you had a lot of ships that were pulled out of the water with great plans for saving them. It didn't happen. And these things ended up being in worse shape than if they had just been left on the bottom. It's something that uh, <coughs> I've heard among uh, I've heard people say that that you know if we didn't bring up this object from underwater, then nobody would ever see it. It wouldn't be preserved. It'd disintegrate and go away. There's 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 really not much truth or things that are submerged underwater, particularly things that are buried, can last thousands of years. So it's it's kind of a weak argument that. Things should be removed from the, the seafloor um, just because otherwise they, they go away. That's not true. The, the marine environment is a pretty great preserver of, of uh, ancient things. I've worked on sites, Stone Age sites in Denmark submerged that we were finding wooden objects that were 9,000 years old. So things in the archaeological record underwater, um, it's, it's a good place to, to protect and preserve things. Ada K. Damon, though, it's at risk, right? It's it's kind of, and, and this is one of the environments that's really difficult for us to work in. These intertidal environments, particularly we have big tides like we do um, in Massachusetts. Um, logistically, they're a nightmare because they're wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. They, Ada K. Damon's remains now are in a, a place where they're going to degrade probably pretty rapidly if, if we don't do something, if they just stay exposed. So. It's a discussion that we're going to be having when we when we do meet with the trustees, and that that meeting should be happening hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Great. Um, so we have two more questions. One is given that the Ada K. Damon is sort of on uh, Crane Beach slash uh, Steep Hill Beach, um, and then in 2014 there was a shipwreck uh, found on Winger Sheik slash Coffins Beach. Yep. Um, do you think there's more chances for other shipwrecks uh, on the sort of two barrier beaches for, you know, Ipswich and Essex to sort of pop up um, for us to find? Well, I think that's, that's just a definite possibility. It's, it's not a if, it's a when. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, as I mentioned, you know, it, now I'm the guy in the job. Um, really need to be thinking long term about how are we going to address these not in a reactionary way but in a proactive way so that we we have a sort of a plan in place for how to how to deal with them when uh, when they do become exposed well you get on that then yeah, I'm uh, get on that. so our last question is as the buar lead can you speak of any coordination with local and state and regional emergency management agencies to proactively document coastal maritime historic resources to prevent them being identified as storm debris and removed during response and recovery operations. Yeah, that's, that's a really, really important um, comment and, and question. What I can tell you is that to my knowledge, there hasn't been, um, I'm not aware that there's been a close coordination with 
those those type of groups in BUAR. But certainly that needs to be a part of that long-term planning that I was talking about because um, that's an essential aspect of, of responding and making sure that the people that are doing the responding for a whole variety of reasons that don't involve cultural resources have training, have exposure, have education to what would be appropriate an appropriate course of action for dealing with those types of resources. So that's another part of the I got to get on it uh, task list that's ahead of me. Mm -hmm. Well, great. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. That's the end of our program for this week. Um, join us in actually three weeks on November 11th uh, for Jen Ort, who will be talking about another site here in Ipswich, uh, which is the Paleolithic site of Bullbrook. If you can't tell, I got to pick the topics, and I like archaeology in my town, clearly. Um, so we hope you can join us. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Sarah Robinson, for joining us and talking about the Ada K. Damon, which is fascinating. Well, Lindsay, thank you. And, and thank everybody who, who is on the call. Um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, I'm very happy to, to hear from you. And I, I feel very, um, it's something that I hold very close to me that uh, I work for all of you. And I want to be your state underwater archaeologist. I want to be the guy that uh, you can ask questions of and, and contact and, and bring out to sites that, that you find um, and to be a, a really active member of, of the historic preservation community here in Massachusetts. Well, thank you. And uh, Deb Fowler uh, had a question about the presentation. Once uh, Mr. Robinson gets approval from the state, uh, this will be posted to YouTube on the Massachusetts Archaeological Society's YouTube page. Okay. I think I think I have approval. I just have to double check. Just double check. You know. Okay. You know, state right. agencies got to do all that. So, okay. um, and if you are a member of any of the Ipswich or Essex uh, local group Facebook pages, I will be posting it there, um, so you can also find that. Awesome. So thank all you, right. everyone. Have thank a you. Great day. Bye. Bye. -bye.